This is Bir Hadach, a Bedouin community in the Negev Desert. Google it, and this is what you'll find. Story after story reporting on crime and clashes with soldiers and police. The Negev Bedouin are descended from nomadic tribes that settled in villages here in the Negev Desert, a region they call the Nakab. And much of the tension behind those headlines comes from the fact that Israel doesn't recognize many of these communities. Almost a third of Bedouin citizens in Israel live in villages considered illegal by the state. And so, the government has a plan to turn this into this. Rahat is the largest Bedouin city in the world. And the Israeli government would be much happier if the Bedouin tribes of the Negev moved into cities like this. And they've been trying to make that happen for decades regardless of what the Bedouin themselves actually want. But what happens when you take a population with a culture that developed in the vast open desert based on family allegiances, feuds and rivalries, and cram them together as neighbors in a city? I met Hani at a cafe at the roadside after a 200 kilometer ride through the Negev desert. Now, keep in mind that everything you're about to see happened just because I mentioned I was interested in learning about Bedouin culture. This was the famous Bedouin hospitality I'd heard so much about. <laughs> Hello. Hani introduced me to his uncle, Salame, and his sons. Same uh, oven? Yeah. Same oven? Yeah. As a chicken out, it's, that's good. Mm. It's good. Good, good and they took me to a building they called the Sheg, where men from the family often meet to chat over coffee and food. Unbeknownst to me, this is also where I'd end up spending the night. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You feel free here, okay? Feel free, okay. Shokran, shokran. The Negev Bedouin make up over a quarter of the total Negev population, and you could make an entire series exploring the ins and outs of this Bedouin culture. But here are some of the basics. Bedouin society is based on tribes, which are made up of a few families or clans, with a sheikh as their head. And a family can mean hundreds, if not thousands of people. Out here in the Negev, villages are mostly made up of one family, which makes living side by side fairly easy. Like most others in Bir Hadaj, Hani and Salame are from the Azazma tribe. Huge importance is placed on loyalty to your clan and tribe. There's a great degree of gender segregation between men and women, a long history of raising animals, and for Negev Bedouin, Sunni Islam plays a huge role in the culture. This is my house. Okay. I have uh, six children. Wow, okay. Six. One uh, woman, one yep. wife. Yep. One wife. The big one is uh, one of the four, four, three, two. Bir Hadaj was only officially recognized by the state in 2004 as part of the Abu Basma plan which eventually saw the recognition of 13 previously unrecognized Bedouin villages. But in a lot of ways, this was only recognition on paper. 
While some of these recognised villages now have services like official schools, most lack infrastructure like paved roads, and residents' homes remain unconnected to the electrical grid and water supplies. I want to see you the electric, electric, the yes. All the electric wow. The you have battery. Yeah. Battery is the sun. Battery, I take my house. Only people have the same, people same okay. and not have electric. Uh, sun and air. Okay. So there is nothing from the main. No, yeah, no, okay. And have all of this. Because we are in a village. Wow. All the time here is sunny. Yeah, of course. It's not England. <laughs> Where does the water come from? Come from in the school. Three kilometers. In a yes, house? Whoa. Yes, three kilometers. Okay. You can't see the same. From the same all, all place. Fa all family. There's one only uh, one one horse here. Evening approached, and we headed back to the shack. But this time, it was much more crowded. This looks so good. <laughs> wow. So you eat this mansaf with your hands, which I'm finding kind of difficult. There's a bit of an art to it. After some of the most incredible hospitality I'd ever experienced, the shag emptied and I was off to sleep. The word Bedouin comes from the Arabic Bedawi, or desert dweller. There are different Bedouin populations throughout Israel and Palestine. The northern or Galilee Bedouin are descended from tribes that moved across from the Syrian desert. The ancestors of the Negev Bedouin, on the other hand, came from Egypt, Jordan, and the Arabian Peninsula. Most I spoke to identified as Palestinian Arabs, and there was a time when they were free to live as they pleased in this region. For a long time, they were nomadic, and eventually, many settled in villages. But since then, they have been subject to a process of forced urbanization, and today live on just 2% of the Negev's total land area. Now it's important to know this story goes back a long way. The Negev Bedouin who view this land as theirs have often found themselves in the path of various rulers' and colonizers' ambitions. In the 1800s, the Ottomans were trying to urbanize the Bedouin. The British did the same in the early 1900s, sometimes through investment, dialogue, and cooperation, but often through coercion. But for the sake of time, will focus mostly on the last 80 years. So, what happened? In May 1948, Israel declared independence, and all of its neighbors attacked at once. Lebanon, Syria, Transjordan, today known as Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen sent troops across the border alongside irregular forces into what had just weeks earlier been a territory administered by the British called Mandatory Palestine. After almost 10 months of fighting, Israel defeated the Arab armies, ensuring its survival as a fledgling state. But as a result, 700,000 Palestinian Arabs fled or were forced to leave their homes for the surrounding countries in what Palestinians refer to as the Nakba, the catastrophe. Among them were tens of thousands of Bedouins. In the years following the war, some of the Bedouin who left returned to the Negev. But from 1950, they faced a new rule. Israel's Black Goat Law, 
it prevented goat grazing outside of private property. And even then, it strictly limited the number of goats a shepherd could have on their land. The state's argument was that it would reduce overgrazing and soil degradation. And while there is some truth to that, it also had another goal. Since most land claimed by the Bedouin is not recognized as private property by the Israeli government, for a lot of Bedouins, grazing their flocks, and in turn their very livelihoods, suddenly became illegal, which left them no choice but to look elsewhere for work. To give you an idea of the government's attitude to the Bedouin at the time, here is Moshe Dayan in 1963, military leader and then Minister of Agriculture. The Bedouin would not live on his land with his herds, but would become an urban person, who comes home in the afternoon and puts his slippers on. His children would go to school, their hair combed and parted. Without coercion, but with government direction, this phenomenon of the Bedouin will disappear. As the search for work forced Bedouin to move, laws were also passed that allowed the state to confiscate land for agriculture, conservation and military purposes. The government also created the 1,100 square kilometer SIAC, or permitted area. And in this region, they built seven cities to house the Bedouin. The Bedouin communities outside this area would become the unrecognized villages. The largest of those seven cities is Rahat. Rahat is the world's largest Bedouin city and was my last stop in the Negev and I'd met a local family who'd agreed to host me and show me around. So I had Mohammed as a guide. No, 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 here don't take Ah, yeah, sure. It's funny, everything, everyone will think that you're a spy, man. Really? Yeah, man. Going around, taking pictures and stuff, he's pointing at you. That was especially lucky because even though it's a city of 80,000 people, there are no hostels or hotels here. This city doesn't have a great reputation in the rest of Israel. Rahat's crime rate is one of the highest in the country, particularly when it comes to gang and gun violence. According to the police chief, over 80% of its serious crime incidents were gun-related in 2021, mostly resulting from disputes over land. If you actually visit, you'll see that the friendliness and hospitality that Bedouin culture is famous for is still very much there but stay long enough, and there are hints of the problems this city faces. Oh. Who's shooting? Like, is yeah, that gonna be like two families? Yeah, yeah, it's two families, but I don't know which. Oh yeah, get used to it. We can't sleep without it. It's like our lullabies. As well as Mohammed, I'd got in touch with Rawan, who runs a makeup business here. Both of them agreed to speak on camera about Rahat and some of the issues facing Bedouin communities. Bedouins are connected to their lands even more than to their families. You take them away from their land, you put them all together. Bedouins are tribes, you know, we have so many different tribes. Not all tribes are friendly, you know, so they ripped the the land from the Bedouins, they put them together and now just coexist, yalla, it's all a big party. It created so much uh, conflict. The Bedouin way of life is uh, more of a free spirit. The entire Negev space was owned by Bedouins and it was divided between them. After the formation of the state of Israel, our space declined to just like 2% of the land right now. We are like way denser population that we used to be. I think it's the cause of most conflict. Bedouins are living like next to each other, on top of each other. It's not what we're used to, historically speaking. So we need to confirm to this a new system that is forced upon us. We are Bedouins living in the desert. Now we have to somehow figure out how to live in a city. And that's not easy. It's a different mentality. 
uh, we're very conservative people, very traditional. Each family likes the privacy, likes that, okay, this is my land, my neighbors are a bit far that there are no tensions between us. And now it's, uh, it's a lot more limiting. And it's not, not as safe as having like the neighbors from the same family. If the, all of their neighbors are from your family, that just feels uh, safer. Now we just, we have this house from family, or neighbor from family, there from family. You know, it's, uh, while, some, while some neighborhoods are fa based on families at, uh, at when first Strahat was built. But now it's, uh, it's not the same. It's less of that. The Negev Bedouin have one of the highest population growth rates in the world, at 5.5% per year. And more people are moving, or being moved, to the cities. That means more people living closer together. Uh, Arad is one of the cities that they're still shoving more people in. Still, uh, every couple of years, there is a new unrecognized village demolished, and the inhabitants of those villages are moved to Rahat or Hora or Ksefer. So we have the Arabian population growing, but the cities are limited. They, they physically can't expand because it's a, a state uh, policy or strategy to put a couple of settlements around it so they can't physically expand. These demolitions are often done with the justification that they are a necessary part of developing the Negev. And you can see why Israel wants to build here. Since it's surrounded by adversaries, it sees this land as vital for its national security. And there are military bases and huge firing ranges that take up much of the land here. The Negev also offers space for the country's growing population. But there is a lot of space here. The Negev is a big land. It's, it's bigger than the rest of Israel, but it has like 12% of the population. So it's empty as well. You can build this wherever you want, but they choose the land where people live. Street number six, I don't know how many unrecognized villages it took with it when it was built. And it's still under development to go more south. The more south it goes, the more land it takes. I don't know, the main weapons factory is being moved to the Negev. It's at north. They want to move it to the Negev at an unrecognized village. Uh, there are the, the problem that happened a couple, a couple of months ago where they uh, tried to demolish two unrecognized villages in order to <laughs> grow a forest in their place. The forces they sent to these villages, 50 police cars, you know, 10 jeeps with swords and a couple of tractors to demolish. Just scary shit, man. A huge force, an army, is going inside this town. All this has led to a crisis of confidence. Many people here simply do not trust the authorities. And there is a view that the police don't really care what happens within Bedouin society, so long as the problems don't spread out into nearby communities. With around half of the Bedouin population in Israel living below the poverty line, the strategy seems to be one of containment and neglect. And until that's resolved, policing within Bedouin communities is mostly left to Bedouin law, the Bedouins' own unofficial justice system. In this system, blood feuds are common, as is an eye for an eye. But conflicts are also often solved through peaceful discussions between family elders and sheikhs. There is no Israeli law enforcement in the Bedouin society. In Rahat, we do have a police station, but I don't know why it's there. Someone could shoot next to a police car and just ignore them and would drive by. The, Be the Bedouin community does ask for the government to get involved. It's not like we don't want them to get involved. Of course, we do respect the Bedouin uh, laws. Of course we do, I'm a Bedouin, I would respect them. But they're now, they're not enough. The sheikhs or the family, they don't have control over the younger generation. We have so many unrecognized villages here. It's 2022 and people live without electricity and clean water. So when you brought up in this place, what do you expect from this child? Like, what do you, when they grow up, what do you expect? Pledge loyalty to, to the government, to the Israeli government. No, you didn't give me anything. 
I have no school, I have no water, I have no, uh, no electricity. You look down on me, you look down on my father, you look down on my mother, of course. What do you expect from a guy, a boy, who grows up in a house with nothing, and if he goes to college and graduates, no one would hire him? What would he do? He would go into the black uh, market. He would sell uh, two guns and uh, build himself a house, a big house. From poverty comes so many problems, gang violence here. It comes from poverty. It doesn't come from people live, uh, living in a good house and a good environment and going to school and having a good education. It doesn't come from that. And we pay the price. The government doesn't pay the price. I pay the price. Um, I'm afraid someone would, uh, I don't know, shoot my brother, shoot my father. This is the reality of being a Bedouin. Rahat is a contradiction. A city built for nomads, home to one of the warmest and friendliest cultures you can find that is also, by its own nature, trapped in conflict with itself. Out in the vast expanse of the Negev, the Bedouin villages have maintained a more traditional way of life, with less conflict between neighbours. But they face demolitions, raids by law enforcement, and little access to state services and various state actions and policies have often intentionally made it much more difficult for the Negev Bedouin to live in their traditional villages. This isn't to say that none of the Bedouin want to live in cities. City life does suit some people, especially in the younger generations. But many people, because of the circumstances, are left without a choice. Bye, Mohammed. Bye, man. Goodbye. Have a nice trip. Thank you. So I left the city wondering what the future of Bedouin culture here might be, when it's under so much pressure from outside forces. Maybe a new government in the future will take a different direction. But for now, demolitions continue, villages remain unrecognized, and an originally nomadic culture is forced to adapt to city life. <laughs>